Ladies and gentlemen, back to the channel. Today, we have got another UFC preview and predictions. The main event this Saturday night is the Karate Hottie, Michelle Watterson, taking on Angela Hill. We also got another 12-fight card here on Saturday night. But folks, if you have not yet, make sure to hit that subscribe button down below for more UFC on the channel. All right, we're going to start here in the lightweight division with Otman Azaitar taking on Kama Worthy. Oh my goodness, this is such a good fight to start off this card. I know it's probably going to be the main card, but I don't know the order yet, so we're just going to start with this. And oh my goodness, is this exciting. So you've got Omen Ozaitar, who is undefeated as a pro, 1-0 in the UFC, won his last fight on UFC 242 over um, last summer on the Habib Poirier last fall um, in Abu Dhabi, won that with a big overhand right, go watch that. Um, it was against Timu Paklin, I believe. Um, yeah, just come with the right overhand, and oh my goodness, put him out. Omen Ozaitar, tremendous striker, has knockout power easily, and that's how he gets all, his, all of his finishes, man, all by knockouts. Also not bad on the ground either, but his knockout power is insane. His striking is way above average, and yeah, I mean, it really reflects it. Like, this dude is an amazing striker, really good Muay Thai as well, fights out of Germany, professional record of 12 and 0 this is a re like stylistically Ozaitar and Kama Worthy is such a fun fight to watch and we'll talk about Kama Worthy here in just a second but yeah Amin Ozaitar undefeated currently man looking really good just got his last win in the UFC looking to go 2 and 0 but he takes on Kama Worthy so, man, I've picked against Kama Worthy in his last two fights in the UFC. Devontae Smith, or it's only two fights, really, in the UFC. First one, Devontae Smith, UFC 241, Cormier Miocic 2 in Anaheim. And Kama Worthy caught Devontae Smith. We talked about this earlier, um, his last fight against Luis Pena. We're going to talk about that in a second, too. But, yeah, I mean, Devontae Smith, huge favor in that fight. Kama Worthy steps in, short notice, and knocks him out with the left. Devontae Smith, one of the best, or one of the biggest um, hyped-up prospects right now, or back then in the UFC and yeah I mean Devontae Smith I mean you're looking at like a minus 800 favor in that fight for um Devontae Smith and then Kama Worthy coming in like a plus 650 and cashes out in the first round and that put him on the map man then I'm um, there gonna try schedule him against Michael Johnson fight never happened so then they gave him violent Bob Ross Luis Pena um over in um in the summer that was on uh Poirier Hooker and yeah I mean I picked Luis Pena and Kama Worthy did it again, man. I, he just dominated strike in that entire fight. I thought he was, he was going to win the decision. And then, bam, he got the guillotine at the end to beat Violent Bob Ross, Luis Pena. So, man, I mean, Kamal Worthy, man, looking really good right now. He is 2-0 in the UFC. Um, He's been on a big winning streak. Ever since 2017, he hasn't lost a fight. Currently um, is on a seven-fight winning streak record of 16 and six. I mean, something to note, he's 33 years old, but still really developed into a really good fighter later on in his career. Started off younger, really wasn't doing too well. Then all of a sudden, man, hits 30, and he's on a damn roll. Um, yeah, fights out of uh, Pittsburgh Academy over in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, okay, prediction. So, Kama Worthy and Amin Ozaitar, such a close fight for me because these dudes are just going to stand there and they're going to trade. I mean, both are decent on the ground, but it's going to be a stand-up fight. It should be, right? Both these guys got huge power. I mean, you saw in the Azaitar's last fight. I mean, just clean knockout in the first. But then Kama Worthy, the Devontae Smith fight too. So both these guys can end a fight just like that. All right, for me, I, I think I'm mean, Ozaitar wins it. I mean, okay, I know this can be my third time picking against Kama Worthy in the UFC. Devontae Smith, Luis Pena, and then I'm going to pick against him again. Just, dude, Azaitar's power is so crazy. He's undefeated, never lost before, and I'm, I can't go against him. I really can't. I mean, he's 30 years old, and Kama Worthy's 33. I still, I think Amin Ozaitar has got the power advantage. I think he's got the striking advantage overall. Kama Worthy might be just a little bit better, honestly, on the ground. But yeah, I'm going Amin Ozaitar to get the job done in this one. But it should be a really fun fight. All right, next up in the women's flyout division, we've got Sabina Mazo taking on Justine Kish. Let's start here with Justine Kish, um, former uh, Ultimate Fighter uh, competitor. She was on uh, season 20, right? So she comes in the UFC, right? First fight uh, against Nina Asparov. And she beats Nina Asparov, which, I mean, I know this is 2016 and this is a while ago, but still, unanimous decision victory um, over Nina Asparov is still big. Next fight, beats Ashley Yoder, all right, wins that one, she's 2-0. Then she gets a fight against a ranked opponent, it is Felice Herrig, and this is the fight, yep, this is the fight where Justine Kish legitimately took a sh in the octagon. I, that, I'm not making this up. Like, look it up. She did. And yeah, dude, it was just all over the... Oh, my God. It's all over the mat and everything. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it, that happened. But 
bounces back, fights Ji Young Kim, who's a top 15 flyweight, uh, loses that fight by split decision in a return to flyweight. She fought a flyweight very beginning of her career. And then uh, most recently did win a fight um, in North Carolina um, on the Blaze Dos Santos card by decision. So Justin Kish really just kind of a balanced fighter. She's going to be kind of balanced everywhere. She has a kickboxing resume, so she's going to want to uh, keep it on the feet. But I mean, the way Felice Herrick beat her, really just to out-wrestle Justin Kish and all, and that's how she's really vulnerable, is if you can take her down, you can really work on her for four, three rounds and really ride out a decision. I mean, Justin Kish isn't really out here trying to get finishes. She's not usually going to get a finish. Probably going to go to the judges' scorecards and really... The way to beat her, take her down, out, out wrestler, out jujitsu, out grappler, and all. But she does take on Sabina Mazo in this one. So what Sabina Mazo really does in all of her fights, she's gonna push you back into the fence. She's gonna work on you, work on you, work on you. Really just gonna try to get strikes off really in close distances in the clinch. And that's really how she wins fights. That's how she beat JJ Aldridge, her last fight, UFC 246. Very close fight, split decision, win though for Sabina Mazo in that one. Before that, she beat Shayna Dobson, which Shayna Dobson, of course, I talked about earlier, uh, two weeks ago or three weeks ago, against Maria Agapova. Again, my big, it, there's no chance in hell Maria Agapova loses. And Shayna Dobson comes comes in and knocks her out. Uh, okay, I don't know how that happened. But Sabina Mazo owns a win over Shayna Dobson. And then before that, her only loss is to Marina Moroz over on Barbosa Gagey. Her first fight in the UFC in 2019. Lost that by unanimous decision. And before that, came the UFC by doing well in LFA, scoring a couple knockouts in the process over there in LFA as well. Yeah, so basically this fight is going to be a kickboxing matchup for the most part. But I think Sabina Mazo is going to be really good here, forcing this fight against the fence, working it in the clinch, getting some strikes off over there. Of course, Sabina Mazo, the former LFA flyweight champion of the world back in 2018. Of course, um, didn't, never lost the belt because she went to the UFC. Um, I think Sabina Mazo wins this fight. I think she's really just going to be out, be able to out kickbox Justine Kish, work her in the clinch. I think Sabina Mazo gets the job done by a decision. So next up, we've got Roosevelt Roberts taking on Matt Friola. This is going to be an interesting fight here at lightweight. So we're going to start here with uh, Matt Friola. So last fight, Violent Bob Ross, Luis Pena, wins split decision on the Ioana Watterson card over in Tampa in 2019. A lot of people thought Luis Pena could have won that one. Could have gone either way, honestly. I mean, Friola tried, kept taking him down. Pena, though, working well off his back. Really could have gone either way. Before that, uh, Matt Friola did beat Jalen Turner um, by unanimous decision. And then before that, he had a draw against Lando Venata. Lando Venata was really just out of striking Friola that entire fight. I, I mean, I guess it was a draw, but still, I think Venata really got the better of him in that one. Before that, uh, Friola fought... Polo Reyes lost um, that fight by KO on the Stevens uh, and Duhu Choi card um, over in St. Louis, Missouri in 2018. And before that, made his way to the UFC by winning on the Contender Series, um, getting a win over Jose Flores, took him down, and then got him with an arm triangle. Matt Friola, he's always going to fight. Take down, take down, take down. Look for a submission, look for a submission. That's really his style of fighting. And it's an interesting narrative in this fight because we're going to talk about Roosevelt Roberts here in just a second. But yeah, Friola going to come into fights. He's looking for that takedown. He's not really going to look to strike with you. He's going to look for the takedown. He's going to look for the submission on the ground. Really not going to look too much for ground pound. He's going to look primarily for the submission. But he takes on a guy who works really well off his back as well in Roosevelt Roberts. So, you know, some fights, Roosevelt Roberts will just go in there and let his opponent take him down. I mean, early in his career, I mean, I would say like his first four fights, he would let his opponents just take him down. And then he would try to wrap his legs, get a guillotine in, and I mean, some of those fights, it worked. He would just let his opponent take him down. Boom, grab onto the neck and win the fight. So, comes in the UFC, has a fight at, fight in Bellator in 2018, then gets the call on the Contender Series, wins that fight by Rene Choke, then gets another fight um, against Daryl Horcher, wins that fight by Guillotine, then picks up another win by decision, and then he fights Vince Michelle and loses that fight by unanimous decision, comes back, wins a couple fights, beats Brock Weaver by Rene Naked Choke, and then most recently fought Jim Miller, and Jim Miller got the job done in about one minute. Real big upset in that one. Jim Miller got the win. So, Roberts and Friola, really interesting match of styles here because Friola, the wrestler, who's really not bad top game either. Roosevelt Roberts, jiu-jitsu, not a bad striker as well, but really known for his jiu-jitsu. Um, I mean, we could see a weird scenario where this fight's just going to be a stand-up fight. You're going to see this two-dude strike. I doubt it. I honestly think it's going to be a ground game. Real chess match in this one between Roberts and Friola. I'm going to go with the wrestler. I'm going to go with Matt Friola to get the job done in this one. Fighting at Sarah Longo um, over in New York. I think he's just going to be able to take him down. And I think he's going to be able to hold Roosevelt Roberts. I know Roosevelt Roberts is going to look for transitions, look for transitions some more, and look for um, a submission. But I got to go Friola. I think Friola is going to get the job done. I'm not going to say a finish. I think Friola is going to win this one by unanimous decision. I think we're going to see something kind of like the Luis Pena fight where, where uh, Friola's opponent is going to look for submissions all the time in Roosevelt Roberts. He's going to have his moments, but I think Friola is just going to be able to 
outwork him for three rounds. We're going to go with the decision win for Matt Friola. I could definitely go Roseville Roberts' way, though. I mean, I'm definitely not putting it past him. But for now, we are going to go with Matt Friola. All right, so next up, we have got Anthony Aquaman Ivy taking on Brian Barbarena. Let's start here with Anthony Ivy. So... First fight in the UFC, real anticipated debut here from Anthony Ivey. Finally makes it to the UFC. He is 8-2 um, coming in this fight. And then Christian Aguilera catches him with the hook in the first round. Stops the hype. Obviously, we saw Christian Aguilera just fight a couple weeks ago. But Anthony Ivey, man, just got put out by Christian Aguilera. So now, it doesn't get any easier, though. I mean, Brian Barberena is not an easy second fight in the UFC. And when you're coming off a loss, too. So... Overall, though, I mean, Anthony Ivy, amazing power, amazing striking. That's really where he came into the UFC with the big striking power. And really, that's why such a shock he lost to Christian Aguilera. Because Aguilera kind of beat Anthony Ivy the way Anthony Ivy was supposed to beat Christian Aguilera. He's supposed to beat him with a big shot. He's supposed to put him down with a heavy strike, a heavy hand. And he didn't. And Christian Aguilera got the win. Anthony Ivy, man, I mean, he's just going to come out. He's going to swing. It's And same with Brian Barberina. We're going to talk about Barberina here in just a couple seconds. But yeah, Ivy going to come out there. He's going to look to throw. I, the, the past, man, I mean, just in Fury, he went through people. In Fury FC, I went on a five-fight winning streak. Then got Aguilera. Ended up losing that fight. But he takes on a UFC veteran in Brian Barberina. So, man, the levels of opponents Brian Barberina has faced in the UFC in the last six years is absolutely insane. You got Sage Northcutt. Worley Alvis, you got Colby Covington, you got Leon Edwards, Jake Ellenberger, Vicente Luque, Randy Brown. Oh my goodness, that is a murderer's row of welterweights. And I know there's different levels between Worley Alves and, and Sage Northcutt and going up to Colby Covington. I know there is, but still. And Bar Barbarina, man, has a win over Sage Northcutt. I don't know how much that means now, but back then, that meant a lot. A win over Sage Northcutt. He was supposed to be the new superstar of the UFC. That didn't turn out. Went to one championship, got knocked out. Real unfortunate for Sage Northcutt. But I mean, still, he's 24. That's another story for another day, though. But Brian Barbarina, man, coming off a two-fight losing streak. Vicente Luque um, on the Nganu Velasquez card early 2019. Fight of the night there. Could have won fight of the year. That was such an amazing fight. Luque, though, got the win. And Vicente Luque is an amazing fighter. I mean, top 10 name right now in the weight class. And then Randy Brown, too. Top 15 guy in the weight class. That was Barbarina's last fight. Got into another war um, on the Moicano Zombie card in South Korea. Lost that by KO in the third round. Of course, Luque fight lost by KO in the third round as well. Um, Barbarina's last win was against Jake Ellenberger in 2018 on the Nebraska card with Gagey and Vic. I mean, Ellenberger, really, he's not... I, he hasn't fought since. He's on, like, his five-fight losing streak. Again, Ellenberger's kind of one of those guys, who, I mean, has fought a lot of big names, but uh, Barbarina, man, the levels that of guys he's fought. I mean, Covington and Edwards in two of your last three fights at the point um, in 2017, crazy. But, I mean, again, Luke and Brown back-to-back -back is not easy at all. Brian Barbarina, he's going to stand there. He's going to he's gonna trade. That's really how he fights. I mean, the Colby, the loss to Colby, Colby just kept taking him down, and really that was a smart move in that fight because Colby Covington such a better wrestler, of course, than Brian Barbarina. But, I mean, this sets up for an interesting fight because Barbarina, he's got knockout power, but he's more of a volume guy as Anthony Ivey is going to come out there throwing everything he's got with power. So, it's really volume versus power. Again, it, Ivey's not bad, though, <laughs> standing there for three rounds. It's an interesting fight between Barbarina and Ivey. Oh, my. So, basically, I think this is how it goes. If Ivy can land one in the first round, it's over. But if it goes in the second and third rounds, I mean, Brian Barberena has has been so good just extending the fights to later rounds, and he's not bad going deep into the fight as well. So, I'm going to go with Brian Barberena. I Definitely, I can see Ivy win this, winning this fight, too. Obviously, you can say maybe that Christian Aguilera loss is a fluke. You know, just got caught, definitely. But, I mean, Barberena, the body of work is there. He's fighting his most, some of the like, best fighters right now in the 170 division, and I got to go with him. I think Brian Barberena is going to get the win. It should be an all-out war. I'm going to go Brian Barberena getting the win by unanimous decision. Should be a fun one, though, no matter what. Could definitely see it going either way. All right, so next up, we've got Billy Corantillo taking on Kyle Nelson. Let's start here with Billy Corantillo. His last fight beat Spike Carlisle um, over on the uh, Woodley Burns card. Uh, that fight was a short notice fight. Got pushed up to the main card. Was, I, I believe, the third to last fight on the entire card. Really fun fight. A lot of people thought that was Spike Carlisle won that fight. Corantillo did get the nod, though, 29-28 by unanimous decision. Before that, got a win by triangle choke um, over in 2019 December, and then before that, got his way in the UFC by beating Kamala Kirk 
on the contender series um, in the third round. Billy Quartillo, really good ground game, really good stand-up game too. He's going to take you down. He's going to work you on the ground. Really going to get either look, look for a submission or look for a KO or TKO on the ground as well. Not bad stand-up as well for Billy Quartillo. Really good um, striker all around. Overall record currently though of 14 and 2. He takes on though another really experienced fighter in Kyle Nelson. So Kyle Nelson's last fight did win on the Yair Rodriguez and Jeremy Stevens one card um, over in Mexico City with a win, a TKO win in the first round in about a minute over Marco Polo Reyes. And before that, lost his first two fights in the UFC. His first one actually was against Carlos Diego Ferreira. So not a bad loss. Your first fight in the UFC, UFC 231, um, Holloway Ortega in Toronto, Ontario, um, Canada. Um, also, Kyle Nelson owns a win over Kama Worthy over in 2017. That was before um, Kama Worthy really got on his big run of winning fights. Um, but yeah, Kyle Nelson got a win there. Kyle Nelson, really good all around, really good ground game, really good striking game too. So, I mean, this is kind of a real even matchup here, honestly, in my opinion, between Quarantillo and Kyle Nelson. Both guys can strike, both guys can wrestle, both guys can grapple. It's a really fun fight in all um, odds right now, about even on this one. It's just a real good fight here because Quarantillo, man, coming off that momentum, he's one of the contender series, one, two already in the UFC. And then you got Kyle Nelson, right, coming off that big win over Marco Polo Reyes. All right, prediction. I'm going Billy Quarantillo. I think he's going to keep his big um, winning streak alive here, or his undefeated streak, honestly, in the UFC as well. We've seen Kyle Nelson not perform as well when he fought Carlos Diego Fergia. I, I'm not comparing um, Fergia from our two Billy Quarantillo at all, but still, Quarantillo, really good ever, really good stamina as well. Despite Carlisle fight, I mean, give or take what you think, of the result of that fight. You could have thought Spike Carlisle won that fight or Carantillo won that fight. Really interesting though because you saw Carantillo go three rounds for the first time um, in the UFC. You saw him really go into deep waters. He was in trouble in that fight against Spike Carlisle and he still came out in the end. So that's why I'm going Carantillo. Again, another one of those fights though. I wouldn't be surprised if Kyle Nelson wins but I think Billy Carantillo can get the job done in this one. So next up, we've got Brock Weaver taking on Frank Camacho. Let's start here with the underdog in this fight. We've got Brock Weaver. Last fight in the UFC was against Roosevelt Roberts. In that fight, Roosevelt Roberts really just dominated the entire fight. Um, took the fight to the ground. Brock Weaver really didn't do much on the ground. And yeah, Roosevelt Roberts took back, got through a naked choke finish, and won the fight in the second round. Before that, um, Brock Weaver's first fight in the UFC was against Rodrigo Vargas. Um, the fight really didn't get going. It was in the first round. Illegal knee to the head. Uh, Weaver can continue, so he did pick up the win in that one, and then yeah, of course the Roberts fight after. Um, guys winning the UFC by winning the contender series, won by unanimous decision, and yeah, so that's really his tenure currently in the UFC. Brock Weaver, I mean, an all right striker. He's basically a kickboxer. He's not great, but he's not bad either. Um, I, I would say more of a boxer than a kickboxer at all. He has experience in bare knuckle fighting. And he lost his one fight there. But yeah, that's Brock Weaver. He takes on, though, a UFC veteran in Frank Camacho. So, uh, Frank Camacho is always going to get into wars when he steps into the octagon. I mean, all of his fights are just going to be stand-up fights. And both men are going to throw his last fight. Justin Janes on the Blades Volkov card um, did lose that fight by TKO. It was only 40 seconds in the fight. But yeah, Justin Janes got the job done by TKO. And now, only about three months later, Frank Camacho is coming back into the octagon to fight once more um, against Brock Weaver. Before that, Camacho fought Benil Dariush on the Ben Askren uh, and Damian Maia card. Lost that fight, fight by Rune Kachoke in the first round. And also, um, Camacho has fights against Drew Dober. Lost that one by name of decision. Uh, Jeff Neal lost that one by head kick. And then Li Jing Lang as well lost that one um, as well. He has two wins in the UFC, so currently sits at a record of 2-5 and five in the UFC. But of course, every Frank Camacho fight is going to be an exciting fight because he's going to come in there and he's just going to throw everything he's got. Um, before the UFC, Frank Camacho um, fought in Guam. Guam. So he's, he's born in Guam and he, all of his fights mostly are from Guam or the Northern Marina Islands. Before UFC, of course, big winning streak. He was at 24 and then now, of course, he is 22 and 9. As a prediction in this fight, Brock Weaver, Frank Camacho. I'm going to go with Frank Camacho. Usually I don't pick guys who just got knocked out not that long ago. Three months ago, still a little bit of time for only a 40 second fight, but still got knocked out. I don't really trust Brock Weaver to get the job done in this one. I'm going to keep it real. I just don't. I think Frank Camacho, both guys probably just going to stand there and they're going to trade. I think Frank Camacho is all around a better striker than Brock Weaver. It's going to be a boxing fight. And I think Camacho is just better all around there. So we're going to go with Frank Camacho to get the win in this one. So next up at Flyweight, we've got Tyson Nam taking on Matchnell. Let's start with Tyson Nam 
in this one. So, Tyson Nam's last fight did get the job done, but it was at Bantamweight, not at Flyweight. Got the, the KO finish like 30 seconds in the fight on iCal Vio. I believe that was the first fight of that entire card. Tyson Nam did get the job done in that. His first two fights in the UFC, first one, not an easy task at all. Uh, Bellator fighter now, Sergio Pettis, was Tyson Nam's first opponent. Lost that one by Nam's decision. And then took on another top 10 flyweight as well in Kai Kara, France, on Felder and Hooker over in Auckland, New Zealand earlier this year. Lost both those fights by unanimous decision, did Tyson Nam. Before that, um, he was fighting in Hawaii. That's how he got his shot in the UFC. Currently holds a record of 19, 11, and 1. I mean, Tyson Nam's got surprisingly good knockout power. I mean, as we saw in his last fight, again, he was at Bantamweight. He's going back to flyweight in this fight here, but... As, I mean, he's got some really good knockout power, and he can always land one. But Matt Schnell, very good grappler, very good at getting the fight to the ground. So that's probably where he's going to go in this fight. But if Tyson Nam can land one, man, he's going to have a really good shot in this fight. But let's talk about his opponent, Matt Schnell. So, of course, Matt Schnell um, got his start in the UFC on the Ultimate Fighter um, Tournament Champions. It was the flyweight thing won by Tim Elliott. He lost in the second round to Tim Elliott, the eventual winner of that show. He went on and fought Demetrius Johnson. Obviously, that, that fight did not end up too well for Tim Elliott. But yeah, Matt Schnell um, won his first fight, lost his second. Came in the UFC, fought Rob Font, lost that fight at Bantamweight by KO. Then he fought Hector Sandoval, lost that fight again on uh, Cub Swanson and Artem Lobov over in Nashville, Tennessee in 2017. Then after, fought Marco Beltran, got the job done by unanimous decision, then beat Naoki in a way, won that by split decision, then beat Luis Smoka by triangle choke. Of course, Snell's um, grappling so damn good, man. He can get fights to the ground so easily. He can get submissions at ease. That's his strong suit, really. Then he fought Jordan Espinosa. Same thing, man. Got him to the ground early in the fight, in the first round, like a minute in. Got him down, triangle choke, fight over, just like that. And then his most recent fight, Edgar and Korean Zombie over in December of last year against Alexandre Pantoja. And Pantoja caught him, man, in the first round. Knocked him out with a big right. And that really put the end to the big 4-5 winning streak here for Matt Schnell. So currently, he holds a record of 14-5. and five. He's number 9 right now in the UFC flyweight rankings as Tyson um, Nam, I think, is 15. So yes, 9 versus 15 in this one. Um, as, as for a prediction, I'm going to go with Matt Schnell. I think the grappling for Schnell is going to be so much better than Tyson Nam, obviously. And I think Nam's striking is going to be a little, little bit better than Schnell, too. But I think the grappling is just going to overweigh the striking from Nam because Schnell can just take this fight to the ground. I think he's going to be able to get a submission finish. I don't know if he's going to get it in the first round or not, but I think he's going to be able to get it done some point in the fight. So we are going with the submission win here for Matt Schnell. So how this next fight came about is really interesting. So you got Sajar Eubanks here and Julia Avila. So... Um, Avila last week was supposed to fight the former uh, UFC flyweight champion Nico Montano, but Montano had to um, withdraw from the fight because of travel restrictions, I do believe. And then Sajar Eubanks last week was supposed to fight. Um, uh, she was supposed to fight Carol Rosa, yeah. She was supposed to fight Carol Rosa, but then Eubanks couldn't make weight, so she had to pull out of that. So this time, Sajar Eubanks is going to take a fight a week after, and she's going to fight Julia Avila. So we talked about Eubanks last week, but we'll talk about her again here. So last fight beat Sarah uh, Moras by unanimous decision on the Smith to share a card over in Florida in May. Before that, she lost to Bech Cohea, which uh, that's not a good that's not a good loss at all. Um, if you lose to Bech Cohea, I, I don't know. And Bech Cohea, man, really dominated Sajar Eubanks in that fight. And this is a common theme of Sajar Eubanks fights. Her stamina is terrible. Her cardio is terrible. I mean, I know he, she won her last fight by unanimous decision, three-round fight, but still, she's going to have trouble going that full 15 minutes, and that Bech Cohea fight really showed. I mean, Bech Cohea took her into the deep rounds of that fight, or the deep minutes of that fight, and won that fight by unanimous decision. And before that, um, Sir Eubanks fought Aspen Ladd, which, I mean, Aspen Ladd, top 10, top 5, maybe, 135-pounder right now, and lost that fight by unanimous decision. Did win um, fight of the night in that one on Dos Anjos Lee over in New York in 2019. Before that, Sajar Eubanks fought Roxanne Monteferi when she was still fighting at 125. Missed weight in that fight, but did get the win for that. Fought another top five, top 10, um, 125 pounder in Lauren Murphy. Won that by unanimous decision. And that's really how she got the weight in the UFC. Before that, Ultimate Fighter, of course. Uh, went 3 0 there. We talked about it last week. She basically got her shot. She was going to get her shot in the Ultimate Fighter show. She was going to fight Nico Montano for the title. She beat Roxanne Monteferi in the semifinals. And then Sajar Eubanks missed weight, so she never got the shot for the title. Of course, of course, I think she was scheduled to face Valentina Shevchenko in the main event in Madison Square Garden for the title. That that never happened. It fell through. So yeah, Sajara Eubanks still struggles to miss weight though. Honestly, at 135 for her last fight um, last week. 
didn't happen against Carosa because she could not make weight. All right, her opponent though in this fight is a very talented fighter in Julia Avila. So Julia Avila's last fight was on iCalvio, won that fight against Gina Mazzani by TKO in the first round about 20 seconds and got the job done. Before that, she beat Panny Kienzad by unanimous decision over at UFC 239, um, got the job done by unanimous decision, pretty dominant performance right there by Julia Avila. Before that, beat Alexa Connors over in Invica, um, got the job done there uh, by TKO by a front kick and finished the fight down on the ground. Um, just notable wins. Her first ever pro fight was in 2012 and it was just marrying Renault and she got the job done by unanimous decision just want to put that out there and their second fight our third fight ever was against Nico Montano um over in 2017 got the job done there as well by unanimous decision um honestly I think Julia Vila is just gonna win this fight pretty easily unless unless Sajar Eubanks can land one in the first round but the thing is Julia Vila has got power too so you can't really just say Sajar Eubanks her shots in this fight is if she can land the big power punch but you can't forget Julia Vila can land the power that power punch too so it's really and, and and Julia Vila can really go three rounds pretty well. I, I think she's well conditioned for this three round fight. Sajara Eubanks, you never know. She kind of gasses after the second half of the second round. She usually just kind of shuts down. And that's a big problem in every Sajara Eubanks fight because she still she still has trouble cutting weight. And that's her big thing. So I think Avila wins this fight pretty easily. I think I think she's going to win a unanimous decision. I think she's going to pick up on really every Sajara Eubanks fight. Just the Bech Koya fight especially. Bech Koya did nothing special in that fight except for out condition and outwork Sajar Eubanks and that's what Julia Vila is going to be able to do. She, yes, she can put her out in the first round just like she did her last fight and against uh, Alexa Connors but I think um, we're going to see a pretty dominant win here for Julia Vila by decision. So next up, honestly, one of the most, I mean, I think this is probably the best fight on the card right here. You got Ed Herman and you got Mike Slow Rodriguez. Actually, the next fight has a case for that too. But yeah, Ed Herman and Mike Slow Rodriguez. So, Ed Herman was supposed to fight, um, I believe, earlier this month. It was, um, oh, this was on, uh, this was against Mearshart. Supposed to fight Gerald Mearshart on Brunson, Shabazian. Um, Mershart had to pull out, and so Ed Herman wasn't going to fight anymore. He was pissed. But then um, he was, <laughs> he was going to fight, or Kevin Holland wanted to fight him. The night of, because I believe that Giles got hurt or, or passed out backstage. Really weird situation there. So Herman was Herman was supposed to, they wanted Herman to fight um, Holland, but never happened. It was a really weird scenario. It never happened. So now Herman is not getting Jeremy Rochard anymore. He's getting Mike Rodriguez. But Ed Herman, his style, he's kind of a brawler. He's just going to stand there. He's going to brawl. He's actually not bad on the ground too either. He has a lot of submission wins as well. But let's go over some of his last fights. So. Last fight was in November of 2019 in Moscow on to beat Magomed Sharipov and Calvin Cater, beat Kadias uh, Ibrahimov by unanimous decision. Really big win there by Ed Herman, honestly. And then before that, Patrick Cummings. Patrick Cummings, I mean, isn't great anymore, really. I mean, he was just there. And the reason why Patrick Cummings is in the UFC is because he's supposed to fight Daniel Cormier when Cormier needed an opponent. I mean, that's really why he is there still. Um, and Ed Herman got the job done by a knee and finished it on the ground. Before that, I mean, the losses here for Ed Herman, you got Jan Vellante, split decision, not great. Great, Jan Vellante, yeah, it doesn't do much, really. Uh, C.B. Dalloway, who's on a big losing streak right now, but C.B. Dalloway, yeah. Uh, Nikita Kirilov, that's not a bad loss at all. Kirilov is top 15 right now um, in his weight class. And then you got Tim Boach before that. Tim Boach, uh, this is 2016, too. Tim Boach kind of, I don't, I haven't, I, when's the last time Tim Boach fought? I mean, it's been a while since Tim Boach has fought. Um, it was, yeah, it was, oh, okay, it was 2019. Omar Ahmed of Luis Dos Santos lost that fight by name's decision. But yeah, it's been a while since, really, Tim Boach has done a notable thing right now in the UFC. Before that, Herman fought Derek Brunson, lost that fight, beat Rafael Atal before that. And yeah, I mean, Ed Herman's been fighting the UFC since 2005. So, I mean, he's got the experience, man. He's been fighting since 2005, fought a lot of big names. He's 40 years old, about to be 40 years old, currently 39. He takes on a guy, though, in Mike Rodriguez, who's coming off a big win just a couple weeks ago. So, Mike Slow Rodriguez. Why his nickname is Slow, I have zero clue, but it's Mike Slow Rodriguez. Like, why would you want your nickname to be Slow? I, I still don't know. But Mike Rodriguez last fight beat Marcin Prochny. Yeah, we talked about that fight. It was a really interesting fight because I'm, I'm pretty sure that's a co-main event on Munoz and Edgar, right? And it was a really weird spot because Prochny yeah, was 0-3 in the UFC. Now he's 0-4. Mike Rodriguez, I mean, he's 1-2 or 1-1 or 1-1 one, 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 or one, yeah, one, one, and 1 with one, one no contest coming in that fight. Really interesting spot for that fight. Uh, Rodriguez got the job done by KO with the elbow. Finished the fight. Um, but I, I don't know. Like, I know that was a really good knockout for Mike Rodriguez, but it's kind of like 
Marcin Prochniak was really good um, over in one championship. He was a former number one contender over there. But once he came to the UFC, man, I mean, Prochniak, just like every single time he stepped in the octagon, it was like Prochniak was looking for a way to get knocked out. I know that's kind of messed up to say, but like when he was fighting, man, the Sam Alvey fight, every single shot, he would just duck right into uppercut every single time. And, and I know, like... Prashnyao just did not look in the UFC. I'm pretty sure he's going to get cut eventually. He's not. I doubt he fights again in the UFC. So, I don't want to take any credit away from Mike Rodriguez in that fight, but I kind of have to because Prashnyao has not been good in the UFC. Before that, um, Rodriguez lost to Dong Jung by KO on Edgar Korean Zombie in 2019. Before that, no contest against John Allen in that fight, but um, lost that fight originally got overturned to no, no contest so you can kind of say he's one and two but all right whatever um for that won a fight by tko on uh lee i quinted last ever ufc card on fox i missed those days badly and um before that uh lost his first fight in the ufc against devin clark by unanimous decision as well guys winning the ufc by the way with a uh, flying knee ko on the contender series over in 2017 so we've got mike rodriguez we've got ed herman all right, prediction. I'm going to go Ed Herman. I think, I know, this is kind of a weird prediction because I know Ed Herman's 40. I know Mike Rodriguez is coming off a big knockout. But again, I kind of feel like this is more Marcin Prosh now being, not being that great in the UFC more than Rodriguez being good. I, I think my, Mike Rodriguez is a very good fighter. But you look at Ed Herman, you look at the body work for Ed Herman, I think he's going to be, it's going he's just going to have enough to beat Mike Rodriguez. You look at what Mike Rodriguez has done before the Prosh now fight, it is not great. It is not great at all. So I'm going to go with Ed Herman to get the job done by decision. I Definitely, I could see Rodriguez winning this fight. I mean, he's just coming back two weeks after he's feeling himself, right? Coming back, right, stepping back in the octagon. But we're going to go with Ed Herman to get the job done. Hopefully, this fight actually happens now for Ed Herman. So we're going to go with Ed Herman by unanimous decision. So I talked about how I was really excited for the Ed Herman and Mike Rodriguez fight. I am really excited for this fight, too. Honestly, I wouldn't be mad if this was the main event. We got Alan Patrick and you got Bobby Green over at Lightweight. So this fight wasn't supposed to happen. Alan Patrick was uh, originally supposed to fight uh, Vargas, but Vargas had to pull out. So here comes Bobby Green again fighting for the third time in the last three months. So this is a very exciting fight. Let's start here with Alan Patrick. So Patrick has not fought for a damn long time. Last fight was at UFC 229 over in 2018. That was That's Habib McGregor, and he lost by, to Scott Holtzman by a KO. Uh, I believe Holtzman got him with an elbow and finished the fight there. And yeah, Holtzman got the job done in that one. That was Patrick's um, second loss in the UFC. Before that, um, was on a big winning streak. Has wins over Damian Brown, Stevie Ray, right? by All by decision. And then he lost his second fight in the UFC, or his third fight in the UFC, by a head kick as well. Second fight in the UFC, though, John McDessie. Really good win in that one. Won that fight at UFC 169. Nice on um, Henan Burrell and um, I think that was Henan Burrell and Jirai Faber. And um, Alan Patrick got the job, now, job done in that one. That was the second fight in the UFC. And his first fight, Garrett Whitley won that one by TKO on Damian Maia and Josh Shields on a UFC fight night. And Fox Sports won over in 2013 in Brazil. So, Alan Patrick has not fought in a while. 2018, I mean, Connor. Connor and um, Khabib, that's a damn long time ago. I mean, Connor McGregor has fought more recently than Alan Patrick. So, Patrick is going to throw a lot of different stuff in his fights. Um, he's not bad ever. He's a real balanced fighter, but I mean, he's not bad on the feet either. He's really going to look for more volume over power, honestly, in Alan Patrick fight, but not bad, though, with the groundwork as well. But Bobby Green, man, has looked really good in his last couple of fights. Let's talk about the UFC veteran here in Bobby Green. And before we start with Bobby Green, honestly, for Alan Patrick, he's probably going to start, he's probably just going to try to shoot on Bobby Green this entire fight. Might be a pretty good strategy. I mean, we saw in the Holtzman fight, that's really what he did the entire fight, but then Holtzman caught him. But I mean, I don't know. It, it, Patrick's not bad on the feet either, but he's probably going to start shooting on Bobby Green in this fight. All right, but now let's talk about Bobby Green. So, Bobby Green, man, last two fights. Clay Guida on Blaze Volkov got the job done in that one by unanimous decision. And um, his last fight got the job done again against Lando Venata. So two fight winning streak here for Bobby Green. He has looked really good in the last two fights, man. Lando Venata fight was a banger. And that's why I'm kind of concerned. That was just a month ago. It was fight of the night. Took some shots in that one. He's coming back now against Alan Patrick. But Alan Patrick really, I mean... I, don't, I wouldn't say there's there's much of a knockout threat right there with Alan Patrick. More of a volume, but still, there's a threat. Um, but Bobby Green, yeah, I mean, really got to talk about his recent run. I know 2019, Francisco Ronaldo, close fight on Blakova Chakra, but lost that one by unanimous decision. Before that, lost to Clark Close by unanimous decision as well. But, I mean, the fights that stick out, man, the Guida and Venata fights, those were two very good perform performances right there by Bobby Green. And honestly, some of the best Bobby Green we've seen in a while. I mean, like you have to go back to like strike force days to find a better Bobby Green. Bobby Green has been looking really good. The Guida fight knew how to stuff those damn takedowns. 
put it back on the feet and really just outbox him and Honestly, I think it's gonna be kind of the same fight I'm um, here with Alan Patrick. I think it's gonna be kind of like the Guida fight. Guida tried to keep taking him down. Kinda. I mean, he got it a couple times, but Bobby Green's really good at standing back up once he's down. And I think I think it's a really good fight here for Bobby Green. I think stylistically, it's a really good fight for Bobby Green against Alan Patrick. Because Patrick gonna try to shoot more often than not against Bobby Green. And I think Bobby Green's gonna be able to keep his range. Push Alan Patrick away from getting those damn takedowns. I think he's gonna be able to outstrike him. We are gonna go with the unanimous decision here for Bobby Green. And you know, by the way, Bobby Green, man, so fun to watch too fighting. I mean, the dude throws so many weird angles when he strikes. And it's just, it's a treat to watch. I'm really excited for this fight. Honestly, if it was up, it was up to me, I think this would be the main event. Honestly, Green and Patrick, but it's a good spot here on the main card and we are going with Bobby Green. So next up in the women's flyweight division is the co-main event. It is Andrea Lee taking on Roxanne Mata Ferry. Let's start here with Andrea Lee. Her last two fights, man. Honestly, I think she probably won those last two fights. Maybe not the Joanne Collarwood fight, but definitely the Lauren Murphy fight. I don't know how two judges um, said Lauren Murphy beat Andrea Lee. I don't know how that happened, but somehow Lauren Murphy won the split decision over Andrea Lee over Texas. I don't know. Before that, uh, Joanne Calderwood versus Andrea Lee. Barely another win for Joanne Calder Calderwood, just barely, um, in Abu Dhabi and UFC 242 on um, Poirier Habib. And before that, Andrew Lee beat Monta Montana De La Rosa, Ashley Evans Smith, Veronica Mercado, and then uh, Jamie Thornton over in LFA as well. Also, notable wins over uh, Rachel Ostevich. I, I don't know how much stock you can put into that one. Uh, I mean, it's Rachel Ostevich. That was over in Invicta. And then also, um, so this Roxy Montefiore and Andrew Lee fight is a rematch. I know the first fight was in 2014, split decision. Um, yeah, it was in Houston, Texas in 2014, December. Split decision win for Roxanne Montefiore, so this is technically a rematch. Again, long time ago, but Andrew Lee, her style, she's a kickboxer. That's how she's going to win fights. She's going to try to keep fights standing, which is a very interesting clash of styles here because Roxanne Montefiore, although she isn't bad standing, she's going to try to take fights down, and that's really where she's going to go every single fight. So... You got a wrestler here, Roxanne Montefiore, taking on the kickboxer and the striker here in Andrea Lee. So, let's talk about the UFC veteran here in Roxanne Montefiore. So, the former flyweight championship challenger, I guess, Roxanne Montefiore, in this fight um, against Andrea Lee. Her last fight was against Lauren Murphy. I picked Roxanne Montefiore to win that one. Didn't go our way. Um, Lauren Murphy got the job, job done by name's decision. Just beat Roxanne Montefiore everywhere, man. I mean, really, honestly... If you can, if you can keep Roxanne Montefiore striking, you're probably gonna win the fight, and that's really Andrea Lee's big, big focus point in this fight. If she can stuff the takedowns by Roxanne Montefiore, keep this fight standing, Andrea Lee's gonna win this fight pretty easily. But um, before that, for Roxanne Montefiore, beat Macy Barber, stop the hype train against Macy Barber, and really. Montefiore's striking is underrated because look at the Macy Barber fight. That's how she won the fight. She kicked the, she kicked the living hell out of Macy Barber's legs and won the fight that way. Uh, before that, Montefiore lost to Jennifer Maya. Before that, beat Antonina Shevchenko over in uh, Russia on the Overeem Olenek card. Before that, lost to Sajara Eubanks. Before that, won another fight against Barb Honichak. And then before that, was the title fight against Nico Montano, the finale of the Ultimate Fighter, where Nico Montano did get the job done 48 47. Um, man, Roxanne Montefiore has been fighting for a damn long time. She's been fighting since 2003, and she's got a lot of noble names on her record. I mean, you look at, she fought Shayna Baszler in 2006, and Shayna Baszler won that fight by hammerlock. I mean, it's just a lot of really interesting stats here on this Roxanne Montefiore record. You got Sarah Kaufman um, over in 2010 in Strike Force. Sarah Kaufman won that fight by a KO slam. I mean, you got Ra Raquel Pennington. Uh, Montefiore fought in the UFC once. Um, she fought Bantamweight in 2013. They needed someone to fight uh, Raquel Pennington, so she took that fight. Coming off a six-fight losing streak, they gave her a shot in the UFC, and Mont uh, Montefiore lost um, to Raquel Pennington by unanimous decision, and then she beat Andrew Lee after. But yeah, it's been a long road for Roxanne Montefiore to get to the spot. As for a prediction, though, I gotta go Andrew Lee. Andrew Lee's just, I think all around better than Roxanne Montefiore. I, I think we underrate Montefiore striking, but I mean, Andrew Lee is a kickboxer and she's gonna just destroy Montefiore standing. No, I mean, we could see Montefiore try to take this fight down. Maybe she'll be able to work there, work better. I mean, honestly, she probably will. But big question, can Andrew Lee stuff the takedowns? I think she can. I think she's gonna be able to use her striking to her advantage. And we're gonna go with Andrew Lee to get the job done by him decision. Hopefully she doesn't get screwed over with another split decision loss like her last two fights. But yeah, we're going with Andrew Lee to get the job done here in the co-main event. All right, it is time for the main event of the evening. We've got Angela Hill taking on the karate hottie, Michelle Watterson. Let's start here with Angela Hill. So 
Angela Hill's last fight, Claudia Gadelia. I thought Angela Hill won the fight. She did it. Claudia Gadelia got the split decision win. Now Claudia Gadelia looks like she might be in line for a title shot. Either her or Carla Spars. The 115 weight class right now is really weird, and we're going to talk about it after we make a prediction for this fight. So, yeah, that was the last fight for Angela Hill. Um, has the win over Hannah Cyphers in the last year. Um, and, yeah, I mean, Angela Hill fights all the damn time. And she usually, I mean, some of her fights, the Courtney Casey fight, six out, 20, 2018. Like, I feel like Angela Hill gets screwed over on a lot of decisions. Honestly, kind of like Andrea Lee. But, um, yes, Angela Hill, I thought she beat Courtney Casey, but they gave Courtney Casey the win. I, Hill's fought everyone, man. I mean, you go through a record. She's fought Tisha Torres, Rosamba Yunus, um, Jessica Andrade, Ashley Yoder, uh, Nina Asparov, Maria Moroz, uh, Courtney Casey, Random Marcos, uh, Claudia Gadelia, Hannah Cyphers. Yeah, she's fought a lot of big names. Um, and Carlos Barca as well, right? So, I mean, Angela Hill fucked the best of the best in the 115 weight class. And, yeah, she's really good everywhere, man. Um, over the last couple years, she's really gotten better. I mean, over in, like, 2017, she's losing a lot of fights. But now, man, big three-fight winning streak. Could be on a four-fight winning streak if they gave her the nod against the, in the Gedalia fight. I thought she won again, but they did not give it to her. Um, yeah, really good fighter in Angela Hill. First time ever in a main event spot. First time ever going five rounds. So that's something to note here. But she takes on Michelle Waterson. So the former Invicta Atomweight Champion of the World, Michelle Waterson, um, came to the UFC by beating Paige Van Zandt in her second fight. Uh, really stopped the Paige Van Zandt hype. I believe that at that fight, Paige Van Zandt was like six or five. I think she, Paige, Paige Van Zandt at that fight was five and Waterson was 12. And Paige Van Zandt was a big favor in that fight, and Michelle Waterson just pretty easily um, got her with the judo throw, got took back, and won by your naked choke. And after that, they gave Waterson Rose Nami Yunus, because why not? And Rose Nami Yunus destroyed Michelle Waterson, kind of like Rose Nami Yunus did to Paige Van Zandt. After that, Michelle Waterson fought Tisha Torres, lost that by unanimous decision. But after that, fought Courtney Casey, barely won by split decision. After that, beat Felice Herrick by unanimous decision. Uh, after that, beat Carolina Kovalkiewicz by unanimous decision. And then... That was when that was when Michelle Warson was on her like, kind of run where she was wanting a title shot. So then they were like, all right, you get a number one contenders fight, but you get Yoana Yo and Jacek. And Yoana just destroyed for five rounds. I think it was 50-45, 50-45, 49-46 for, for Yoana. Pretty dominant um, performance with her by Yoana Yo and Jacek. And Michelle Warson's first ever main event of a um, fight night card. That was in October of 2019. And then most recently, Michelle Warson fought Carlos Sparza. Warson just didn't do anything that fight. She really just stood there and didn't do anything. And Esparza just outpointed her. I don't know how his split decision win for um, Carlos Esparza. It should have been unanimous because, I mean, Watterson didn't do anything, man. I, Esparza was the one pushing the pace in that fight. And really, Watterson just kind of stood there and just kind of tried to go for a counter kick out like, the entire damn fight. She was looking for that big right um, roundhouse kick, and she didn't really get anything. So, Esparza won that fight by split decision. So now Watterson is fighting Angela Hill in another main event spot, though. Two fighters coming off of a, of a loss. And they're both getting this main event spot here. Michelle Warson, of course, you know the karate background. Of course, that's in the nickname. She's a great karate fighter. Um, great striking, of course. Same with Angela Hill, though. Really good striking as well. Not really as well karate, of course, because that's Michelle Warson's thing. But Angela Hill, really good boxing as well. Um, currently in the rankings, though, Michelle Warson is the number eight strawweight. And Angela Hill is at number 13. All right. So as for prediction, I'm going to go with Michelle Warson. All right. This is Angela Hill's first ever time going five rounds, and yet we don't know how Angela Hill's going to fight in a five-round fight. She could be fine. She could gas out in the fourth round. We just don't know. But Michelle Warson has been there before, given it's only once. And still, I think Michelle Warson's striking is just going to be too much for Angela Hill. Angela Hill's going to try to do what Michelle Warson's going to try to do, but with this, with boxing. And Michelle Warson's got kicks, too. I think Michelle Warson is going to be too quick for Angela Hill in this fight. And that's why I'm going with Michelle Warson. I can definitely see Angela Hill landing one, honestly, and really just taking over. If she, if Angela Hill can get going in the first round and really show Michelle Warson her power in the first, then she can kind of push the rest of the, push the pace for the rest of the fight and really control the entire fight for the entirety of the five rounds. But I don't think that's going to happen. I think Michelle Warson is going to win a unanimous decision, 49-46 for Michelle Watterson. All right, so now we've got matchmaking here in the division. So Angela Hill, number 13, uh, Michelle Warson, number 8. Honestly, with the win, Watterson doesn't go anywhere because you look at the top. Let's talk about the top 10 here of the Strawy Division. It's just, there's nothing going on because Zhang Wei Li, who knows if she can fight because she's stuck overseas. Then you got Rose Nami Yunus, who just has surgery for a broken or orbital, so she can't fight for a while. Number two is Jessica Andraj, and Jessica Andraj is about to fight, um, oh, she's about to fight, uh, Caitlin Kukchakian over at Flyweight, so she's not fighting at Strawweight straw anymore. You got Tatiana Suarez, who's at three, who, who knows when she's coming back. Four is Yoani Yo and Jacek, who already lost to Zhang Wei Li. Five is Nina Asparov, who's pregnant. 
And then six is Claudia Gadelia, who's supposed to fight, I think, in three weeks' time. So, and then seven is Carla Esparza, and eight is Michelle Watterson. So, to be honest, I mean, Watterson is kind of in the top three of fighters who can actually get a title shot right now. Because it's one, right, like, you take away the top five, because the entire top five is not fighting anytime soon. So then you got, honestly, you got one Gedalia, two Esparza, three Watterson, four, and four Marina Rodriguez. Wow. I mean, so with the win here for um, Watterson, you can't really do an Esparza rematch. I say you do Claudia Gedalia. With a win, if Claudia Gedalia wins her fight, and I don't think Zhang Wili is fighting anytime soon, so I guess for the win for Watterson, you do Gedalia. But then you got Sparza too, but she's already fought Sparza. It's a really weird weight class right now over at 115. And then Angela Hill with the win, man. She's going to take um, number eight in the weight class. I say do Marina Rodriguez at nine. I think that's not a bad fight at all either. And you can do a Sparza and a Dahlia potentially for the number one contenders spot against Zhang Wei Li. I know we saw that fight before, but I mean, that was a really controversial decision. I thought Sparza won that fight against Gedalia. Could have gone either way. So yeah, I mean, the weight class is just all messed up right now. Who knows what's going to happen, but... For your prediction, I'm going with Michelle Waters and get the job done by unanimous decision. And folks, thank y'all for watching this 45 minute plus long um, UFC Fight Night video here on the channel preview and predictions. Big 12 fight card here, not the most name value in this entire card, but still a lot of good fights as well. Folks, thank y'all for watching. Make sure to hit the subscribe button down below for more and Mava forever.